here today to talk about a moonshot that I hope can, we can work. Gabon talked, wait a minute, going off and on. There we go. Talked a bit about my history, so I won't uh, keep repeating it, but here's my twin brother. Here's me. He looks normal. I look like I'm on alcohol or something at a young age. And uh, uh, I'll just kind of whiz through this because he explained it already. So I had hydrocephalus as a child that was missed for about a decade. And thanks to my mom was diagnosed eventually. That's my first a selfie when I was younger uh, to put in a, a shunt into my brain. And I, I never thought I'd be doing a speech like the one I am here today. I'd learned to meditate at age four or five or so in order to kind of retrain myself to speak later on. And uh, I have an unusual EEG as a result of that. Why I'm saying all that is uh, threefold. One, I have a speech impediment device in my ears. It's keeping me from hearing anything that I'm saying. Because when you speak, uh, it reinforces your fluency. When I speak, it's like having a cramp in my calf, only it's my vocal cords. So kind of like when you're walking with a, a, a crampy calf, you be careful of where you, you know, stand. Even on this speech right now, I'm switching words quickly from words I could say or couldn't say, like, you know, a dodgeball of some kind. So I'm unable to do a speech ahead of time or, or prepare it because I don't know which words I'll actually be able to, to use or not. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit vulnerable in front of this group here because I'm getting to know a lot of you on this journey to create companies and other things. Uh, since when I was younger, I couldn't speak fluently. Uh, you'd cause like a grimace in most people who aren't sure what to do, but you also get feedback and said grimace if you say the wrong thing or if you speak, you know, too long or something like that. But for, 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 for me, it was all the same. So at age 28 with my first girlfriend, I, I walked into the elevator without waiting for people to come out. She said, don't you know you're supposed to wait for people to come out? No one ever told me I, you know, I had to wait for people to come out. So if in interacting with any of you, um, I seem to say the wrong thing, it may have been because the word I was hoping to use I wasn't able to, which happens often. Occasionally, the new word's actually superior, so that's helpful from time to time, or if you think I said something I didn't, if it's good, then I'll, you know, I'll take it. And, uh, and uh, sometimes I use accents when I speak, so if I was in the ER, I'd talk like I was from Alabama or Georgia or something, because it's a good accent for sick people, because you can increase the volume, and people don't think that you're angry at an old person when you do that. Um, so on that note, I'm not here to talk about that. As a result of being a physician, I saw crazy things, like, like we know nitroglycerin does not help heart attacks, but we treat people with it every day. You know, of the things for the biggest cause of the death in society, you know, heart disease, we know oxygen isn't helping because, you know, your lungs are fine. We know nitroglycerin doesn't help. And we go through it, and not much of what we do helps. And um, I don't think the heart is as interesting as, you know, the brain is. So, I'd like to keep that from happening to this kind of organ system, essentially. Um, I don't like proposing uh, a problem without a potential solution as a, a social entrepreneur. In the case of QuestBridge, it turned out that there was a bunch of high SAT kids out there who just weren't handing applications in, who were, you know, low income, and that the country had it kind of wrong. They didn't have to remediate kids, they just had to locate the ones who were highly qualified and get them handing applications. It was, it was hard to do, but as simple in principle as that. And so we've had moonshots in our, in our society, and some of them actually worked. How many of you have heard of Ernest Asalve? Anyone in the room? Okay, so he was someone kind of like Reid Hoffman or Steve Jurvetson or a, a, you know, a prominent entrepreneur around 1900 who was a chemist, PhD, you know, a science focused. And he was hanging out with Einstein and Niels Bohr and other people and realizing they weren't interacting with each other and say, well, I can pay for you to go to hotels and kind of hang out with each other, argue with each other. And so 100, over 100 years later, there's the Solvay Conference says in um, astronomy, chemistry, and physics where people get to 
uh, gather every a decade or so, and they figure out what should they do next, kind of with Higgs, you know, boson or, or gravitational waves, or providing people a chance to collaborate. There's nothing like that in healthcare. There's no roadmap, there's no symposiums of all the joint people to come up with a roadmap of what to accomplish and then to figure out how to accomplish it after that. Um, so that picture you see of, uh, that you've probably seen before of all the early Nobel laureates and the early quantum mechanics people was actually organized by Ernest Tassolve years ago. So I'm, I'm hoping that this conference can kind of become an Ernest Salve collectively. As an ER physician, what's, what's good about your ego structure is you know you're not the, the it, because you call in a specialist if you need help with the heart, some things you handle on your own, some people you admit, some people you send home. So it's, it's intuitive to me that, that if there was a problem, I wouldn't try to fix it on my own, but to bring the right people together in the same place and look at it in, in a whole new way. So there's, in, uh, in Asilomar, as an example, when they did the neuroethics of recombinant DNA years ago, you could kind of handle it in, in academia only and in terms of Ernest DeSalve doing physics, that's mostly an academic exercise. The brain's harder because in order to help a human being, it's probably got to head through a company and leave academia. And the companies might not, you know, by by design, um, have other constituents to worry about other than just the impact of the device themselves. Venture a capitalist um, need to have a return or they won't be able to get people to invest in their next you know, fund. So all there's powerful actors here that aren't well coordinated around a significant, around a, a single issue. So um, in this room, are entrepreneurs who are economically liberated, I will say, who are looking for the next thing to do, but who would probably rather not have, have to raise money. There are philanthropists who would rather not execute on an idea. There are venture a capitalists who see an idea they just love, but it doesn't quite meet venture backable criteria. It's too early, it's too small a market, it's unproven technology, but they spent tens of hours or more researching it and they have an anti-portfolio of potential ideas that they've looked over. So if you put all those people around a, a, a table, you can get an entrepreneur with a screened idea from the venture a capitalist. The entrepreneur can actually prove out a model for other people, and the philanthropists can be confident that the idea has been screened and there are good people you know, you know, operating it. So if you, if you change since, since many ideas on the brain need to go through a company, if you change the word a company to idea, a 1x is a self-sustaining idea. It does not meet venture backable criteria. So by definition then, there's a hole to fill of the ideas which could be self-sustaining and quite powerful for humanity. Like Richard Isaacson, who I've had the honor of you know, working with, basically takes the best data out there from exercise, nutrition, supplements, everything, and he's slowing APOE4, homozygous APOE4 people by 20 years having Alzheimer's. That's incredible. It's not a pill. It's not Lipitor. It's not something that you'll get high, you know, margins from it as a human in the loop. But could that be a, you know, a profitable a chain of clinics? I think so. So, um, if we, if we change the concept to a 1x being a home run for the impact of the idea, not expecting the adventure or, or economically aware investor community to have to handle all those ideas, but to bring everyone together in one place to do the following. So today, there's essentially academic philanthropy on the one side, um, a hole in the middle, and then people who have who return aware in, in investing on the other side. What if you could bring those together? Well, the first thing you would have to do is look for the ideas themselves. And I remember um, just before COVID, I walked in the neuroscience meeting, all the abstracts, and it was miles long. 
and I asked, um, where's, uh, you know, thinking on a certain, you know, topic. Well, that will be tomorrow. I said, well, you mean all these abstracts are just for today? And I walked and I looked at every single title. I didn't read the abstracts themselves, but I thought a lot of this isn't any good. And so, but I'm not the one to determine it as an ER physician. So could we also collect the people who could, you know, tell us the ideas that were important? So if you talk to Bill Newsom or other people who are on Obama's brain initiative, they'll say, yeah, we don't know the circuits yet. We need to know the circuits. But a company, a circuit company is probably not a venture backable idea. It's too small of a market. Right, so, so that's the type of thing. So could you be idea focused, kind of filter the pool, is it important? If it's not important, you probably shouldn't you know, be looking at it. And if it's important, could it be self-sustaining? Could it be a 1x at least? And then comes the question, is it, is it appropriate for the classic investor pathway or is it something else? Now, philanthropy can make for profit investments. They just don't normally actually do it. And the supply in that sector, as I'll go through later, is a multiple of what's available in the economically aware sector to make for profit investments. So um, I propose our moonshot being that we try to get a culture or a pool together so that the value of death actually becomes a fertile soil. Because when you look at it, uh, kind of like with QuestBridge, there were all these high SET kids, 6x oversupply of 4.0 low income kids in America for every available financial aid opening at every Ivy League school. But only one in 12 handed applications in. So it, it made it look like a remediation problem when it was actually a recruiting problem. All the capital we need is in the system. I would argue that it's harder to find, but there are engineers and entrepreneurs who don't need to work or want to work only you know, for money. And I know there are good investors who say, I can't put this into my fund, but I spend a lot of energy on this, and I'd like to make sure this technology is protected in some form. Now, even that is creating what looks like an arbitrary distinction between venture and philanthropy, where you can mix them together in ways that Susan McCormick and others will be speaking about today. You could have, like, you know, a Firefox where uh, Mozilla was a nonprofit with a for-profit entity. I don't have the time to go through all of those now, but we'll be going through those over the weekend. So um, to kind of blend the uh, capital flows together is important and get all the right people in the room. The scale is huge. There's a quarter trillion of donor-advised funds on the you know, sidelines, essentially, because there's not an annual requirement for giving. And all that could be... Uh, you know, invested into potential self-sustaining ideas. Um, I'm going to get speed here. Uh, so there's a flywheel, and we'll leave these outside. I won't go through it at length, but there's sort of a, a way to bring an idea through a system. And all these people on this picture are people who've come to Bain Minor Summits in the past, essentially. And here they are mapped by institution or um, person onto, onto this wheel. You know, how do you find the best ideas? How do you sort them? Are they academic philanthropy only, like a gravitational wave detector? Fine. Could they be commercial, you know, advisable? Does it require a new structure? Does it not? And this map here shows people already in our community who are able to do the, the, those things. As an example, and a few examples, Andrew Huberman, who helped us early on with BrainMind, um, was promoting me to meet Dan Siegel, who said, I'm an expert on hypnosis, I want to help more people. And Ariel Poehler was in the room, around Ariel, somewhere, here in the back. We didn't even know they created a company until like a year later. Today, Judson Brewer, who you heard speak, wants to take his mindfulness technologies into rehab clinics where they have an over need and people are backed up because the data is incredible. He's even offered to do it as a revenue generating nonprofit and not even have any equity ownership in it. And so we've been introducing into people for those types of structures here. Um, we've all been to conferences where uh, 
we kind of come in, you know, with spectate. As, as we grow a bit more out of COVID, we will have salons run a theme and, you know, a great evening out on psychedelics or meditation or something. But at these conferences, what we're trying to do is put the pieces together. So it, it could be some year you should come to the conference because you have the, you know, bandwidth to be supportive of, of an entrepreneur or of an idea, and some year you should not. And as you recruit people to it, in every niche, advisors, investors, entrepreneurs, you know, scientists, please keep in mind people who would actually like to dig in and, and help other people get things through. Bear in mind, uh, I'm running out of time, and I promised Diana I would be on time. Uh, so I'll just switch to her. Is she somewhere? Where's Diana? You're wonderful. Uh, I, I'd also like to, to call out, she started helping me with the Dalai Lama work about a decade ago and, and hooked it over to Dharamsala and things like that. Um, other people in the room, uh, Kevin Nguyen, is, are you here Kevin? Or is he outside? He raised uh, tens of millions for a, a company called, the, or helped raise for a incubated a company in our you know, system. We've helped about 16 uh, companies either into existence or significantly along the way with all alternative types of support or by bringing all the right people together. I called it a brain mind because I thought the distinction was sort of, a brain would be like a Parkinson's, depression, things that we think of as a brain illness or brain disease, and mind would be kind of how do you elevate everyone in a, in a, in a world with AR coming and VR, and we know more about nutrition than we've ever known. There are more obese people than we've ever had. And so the notion that we would, you know, auto-direct in a, auto-direct is an example of me almost having, you know, a speech impediment, so I use the word auto instead of another word I was gonna say. It doesn't quite work, but it kind of works. Like, <laughs> so I used it. So we've been uh, really fortunate to have incredible institutions hosting us. This is the first year where we had collaboration of multiple institutions in a single event. And, and that, that will be kind of our pattern heading forward. Um, we do like to bring in experts on how to map things through, some things we've identified as important as mapping the neural circuits, having better theories. And we want to be flexible too with the expertise of people like Reid Hoffman to bring in AI and other topics as they become pertinent. Um, uh, uh, Diana will talk uh, later about her neuroethics initiative. Um, and since we're heading out of COVID now, if any of you have dinners to propose or themes, we have a network of about 4,000 people in Brain, Mind, and Growing. So it's quite possible if you say, you know, we want to have a meeting in a Singapore or in New York on, you know, a Parkinson's or, or something that we'd be able to actually make that happen. Uh, we'll be going to Oxford. Uh, we did have a kind of a VIP mind training event for some of our entrepreneurs and investors with some of the people who were teaching yesterday and we'll probably continue to have bills online and offline. Um, annually, I think we'll become experts at mind training types of things as, as it, not just with meditation, but also how does it interact with psychedelics, how does it interact with BCI, uh, uh, and really get good at that is we get AR and VR so that we don't get a dopamine addicted nation to AR and, and VR essentially. Um, I think I'll even be ahead of time, Diana. I will not go through this list. This is why I'll be on time. And uh, there's multiple ways to be involved. Everything from just being in the eco uh, system itself in which there's no kind of active requirement. This uh, conference is kind of meant more for hands-on all the way to becoming an active you know, advisor or closer to the companies who, who we're helping. But the key is to get enough good people around the room where there's a natural a fit to an interest level. So we'll never ask you to do anything you prefer not to do. Uh, so I'd, I'd love if this moonshot worked and we can recreate Ernest, you know, a solve at scale. And I thank you for your time today very much.